Okay, ladies and gentlemen, another beautiful Wednesday to be alive. Can't really hear Tim. The episode 95 coming up here. Let's grab ourselves a refreshment. Get that posture cranked up. Let's have a hell of a show. Loosen up our judgments out there. How about that? I like that. Okay, we got a great show planned for you here. Uh, episode 95. Uh, we got a bunch of good to- good topics to talk about. Uh, this book of psychology with big ideas simply explained. Uh, I want to go into that a little bit. Uh, but first, my bookie. We've all been there before. A weekend trip to the casino canceled because real life came calling. Well, my bookie's new and improved online casino is here to change the game. Dive into a truly realistic casino experience featuring the latest in slots, progressive jackpots, and live dealer action, all from the comfort of your own home. Take advantage of weekly blackjack tournaments and a brand new collection of high end games for a chance at real cash rewards. The My Bookie Casino provides a Las Vegas experience when the action's in your hand, and the best part is you. You don't even need to wear pants. Your adventure at My Bookie Casino begins today with a generous sign-up bonus using promo code REDHAWK, all caps. That's promo code REDHAWK to secure yourself a sweet deposit de bonus. And that's not all because their revamped loyalty program ensures that you'll be showered with rewards, including free spins, cashback offers, and a host of exclusive VIP perks. The more you play, the more you win. Play anytime, anywhere with the My Bookie Casino. Links in the bio. And also, we got a free newsletter for you every week. It's the gems that stick out from my podcast, uh, The Timbo Sugar Show, what I'm reading lately, um, MMA, kind of combat sports, sports psychology type stuff, and it's free. So the link's in the bio. Click it, put in your email in, and you'll get one weekly newsletter, simple, easy newsletter each week. So we're here with my uh, my good friend and uh, one of the coaches of The Sugar Show, kind of a mentor to me and Sugar. Uh, Brandon Harris, been on multiple times before. Uh, good to see you again, brother. And yes, uh, last night, Mariah's, we had a little get together at our house, and I made some elk burgers. Elk burgers, we had a little bit of fruit. We went on a little walk. The elk burgers turned out not too bad, didn't they? They're awesome, man. Yeah. Because usually, usually you, you eat the elk and shit, and it's a, sometimes a little bit gamey. Yeah, I think for the most part, for me, it's coming from sprouts and things like that. And I don't mind gamey meat, but your burgers were second to none. They're bomb. Yeah, they're straight from the Montana hill. They literally, my dad kills it, brings it to his garage, dissects it, and then he sends it to me. So that's. Did you guys wake up with good sized boners? Did you, Jay? Did you? I always do, but do you? it was an extra, a little extra big yeah, because extra of stuff. That, that meat. Yeah, that meat's good. I think when it's gamey, I think that's, I wonder why that is. I think maybe it's because it got prepared wrong. Maybe they didn't add enough fat to it, or I'm not exactly sure. Well, Mariah was saying that if the blood isn't drained right away or, or oh. immediately, I believe, that could play into the gaminess. So how oh, that it, makes how sense. It, how it's prepared. That would that would make sense. So, you've had a business now. You've been running the PFS Premier Fitness Systems for how many years? Thirteen. Thirteen years. 13. Holy smokes! What in those thirteen years was the most stressful time? Mm, COVID was definitely a, a taxing period. Just not knowing what to. I mean, you know, I think we're always trying to be aware of our expectations, but that was a completely unknown, not knowing if we were going to shut down and really just trying to to pivot to be able to continue to make money, earn revenue and, and I mean, take care of our employees, that type of thing. 
Mm-hmm. But got through that. Um, I think it's always staff. It's always having the right people around. Mm-hmm. You and I have talked about that. It's like take care of the people hey, Brandon, that are really can you, good. Can you uh, talk to the blue? Sorry. Are yep. you good? Yeah, take care of the people that you have that do a good job, though, that type of stuff. But um, yeah, employees and, and people in general can be can be difficult. Yeah. And now recently you just moved in with Chelsea and uh, it's been going good, you say? It is, man. We're three years together or close to that. She always gives me crap about that, but almost three years. And, and I mean, I think you guys know, but she met me through this through the mm-hmm. podcast which is really cool so yeah three years together it's going good and i'm excited for the future i think that's what a lot of people make mistakes they maybe have a good partner a partner that they uh, a girlfriend or whatever it is and they move in pretty quick just to save money mm-hmm. or whatever it is and then just shit fucking goes south and blows up yeah mariah and i waited probably because i was traveling a lot too but we didn't live with together for five years mm-hmm. five plus years and i think that was probably good yeah I'd, i admire that about her she's she's been very good at um sticking to her goals and you know one of those was she wanted to live by herself she really um that was very important or which i think is is imp- it is important for somebody to go through that and to experience what it's like to be on their own and and she's always been very very focused and very uh, goal driven. I respect that about her as a human. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, the benefits of living with a partner, it's just like nice waking up with someone. It's nice going to bed with someone. It's nice cooking, eating together. Um, The struggles, what kind of struggles you guys run into? I mean, mean, normal stuff. I go, I mean, go back to that. I think it's, it's important that we're never our happiness is never based off of somebody else right Mm -hmm. so if we're you know being very dependent or attached to another person that's going to create hurdles in a relationship um i mean so much of our success in as in as a couple i think is from both of our embracing of growth you know and and um cultivating reflection on a day-to-day basis so i think i mean i've been better as a as a person as a partner and she's always been really good at that so normal hurdles man where you're just you just get you know you get flustered or you get you get emotional um but yeah we've we've done pretty good with that that's sweet that's sweet i want to go over a couple things in this uh this book here this is the big ideas explained it's a full uh psychology book it's a pretty thick book and it's it's like it's hundreds of different psychologists and they've they dedicated their lives to certain just topics in psychology and then it talks about kind of what they are and this one was pretty interesting where did you where does that book who suggested that book or rob emerson when he came on here he yeah. g- gave me this okay. book and it's, it's pretty interesting this guy's mahali shiz zent mihalala mm. so He's a Russian guy. I don't know. Maybe that's Russian. Maybe it's not. He was born in 1934 and he's still living. He's an old fart now. And he, he says ecstasy is a step into an alternative universe. And his approach, this was positive psychology. This was his study. When we engage in an activity that we enjoy and that gives enough to challenge our skills, we become absorbed in that activity and reach a state of flow in which four things ha- happen. We are totally focused we feel a sense of serenity. We feel a sense of timelessness. We have a feeling of inner clarity. Above all, we are not conscious of ourselves or the world around us. Flow is a similar state to ecstasy. So read, read the guy's name again. Mihaly. Yeah. So remember the book I gave you, Flow? That's the same author. That's his book. Yeah, so that dude's the grandfather, considered to be like the grandfather of of the concept of flow oh yeah okay yeah which is another good book that's it's it's a little heavy it's a little you know maybe somewhat esoteric in a sense but i think it's a good it's a good read to start to grasp that concept yeah in in that book i kind of bounced around i went towards kind of the middle of the book and then the end of the book and there was just a bunch of shit that i really loved in that book Mm -hmm. um and then he talks about the state of ex- ecstasy people experiencing flow also describe feeling of timelessness clarity serenity which led to 
this guy to liken it to a state of ecstasy. Mm -hmm. A major part of the enjoyment of flow is the sense of being outside everyday reality, totally separated from the cares and worries of ordinary life. Um, this guy said felt flow felt is a key to optimal enjoyment of any activity and consequent consequently to fulfilling life. I think that's why a lot of people enjoy, enjoy jujitsu. Mm hmm. Enjoy okay. jujitsu because it's enough to challenge you. It doesn't get boring. And uh, he says he says in this one here, during cognitive revolution, there was a growing movement in clinical psychology away from seeing patients slowly in terms of their disorder towards a holistic humanist humanistic approach. Carl Rogers were beginning to think about what constituted a good and happy life. Rather than merely alleviating the misery of depression and anxiety from this grew a movement of positive psychology which, which concentrated on finding ways to achieve a good and happy life. And he talks about if it's too easy, you'll get bored, so you can't have flow. And if it's too crazy hard and it scares you, then you're going to have anxiety about it, and then you're not going to be able to reach that flow state. Mm -hmm. So finding things that you're able to reach that in. I wonder how many people go through life and never even get a feel what that feels like ever. I'd say a lot, man. I mean, think of think of just as as humans, how important it us for us to have some type of physical practice. Like that's how we evolved. But in our modern worlds, most people go through their day to day without any any physical challenge. I think if I think of this, I've thought of this recently a lot, is this idea of this spectrum of how people interact with struggles. And the first step would be, or the most common is push it away. Don't even do it. You know, they, they want to do jujitsu, but they're not, I'm just not going to do that. And they'll probably lie to themselves, give them reasons why they can't do it or they won't do it. They're too busy or whatever. And then in the middle, it's like, we just, just endure struggles. This is where I think a lot of people exist where they'll just get through it, right? They're just surviving a class better than pushing it away but they're not fully opening to their experience, which would be the flow state where it's just, they, they're they just experiencing it. They're, even if it's hard, they're letting it be hard. They're open to it. And I and in my in sports performance, you see that, but I think something like jujitsu, you would be able to speak to this, is that somebody that is just open to the struggle, that welcomes it, that's, that's not going to deny that it's, you know, it is hard, but they like that and they're open to it. They tend to progress quicker. That's, that's like that last state. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. A cold plunge rather than just getting in and surviving it. You're like, fuck it. It's cold. I, I'm going to, I'm going to welcome it. I'm going to let it be cold. Yeah. And that aspect of someone's life is so important having struggle having physical things that are difficult that we're progressing through where we can just lose ourselves mm -hmm. in the moment yeah and then you just don't start just building up problems that aren't even fucking there but then he says but how can flow be achieved study cases of people who regularly reached this ecstatic state and realized that it always occurred when the challenge of an activity matched a person's skills the task was doable but also extended their capabilities and demanded total concentration only a reasonable balance of ability and diffi difficulty could lead to flow. If someone's skills were not up to the task, this led to anxiety. And if the task was too easily done, it led to boredom or apathy. Mm. So that's some interesting stuff there. If you find things that you're just immersed in and they literally just bring you right in the moment and you don't think about anything, you don't think about your phone, you don't think about what problems you have, you don't think about anything, you're just able to be in the moment with whatever you're doing. You're pretty lucky. What, so what is it like for you when you are, you're grappling with somebody that is close to your level? Are you able, you're, I imagine most of the practice, you're just letting your, your skills, your instincts take over. You don't necessarily have to think about what you're going to do. It's just happening. Mm -hmm. Right. But a less of a, in that example, a less of a, jujitsu practitioner probably has to think about how they're going to interact with certain situations if a person is you know really good or better than them they're, they're actually having to process what they're going to do next i mean with someone as good as me or even better than me i, I definitely got to think i mean i gotta be i gotta be but i gotta think about just pure jujitsu where to distribute my weight um and, and stuff like that if i'm going with someone who's not near as good as me i could literally close my eyes and just kind of like 
I don't have to think. I can just sweep them, sweep them, pass the guard, take the back, but just whatever. Would you describe um, that, though, with the person that's really good, that it's almost like more of a macro feel? It's mo- almost more – you don't necessarily have to think about the specific move. It's just there. Like you are thinking about jujitsu, but mm-hmm. it's more of a – Yeah, reaction. Yeah. Just reacting to it. Yeah, for sure. Because when people talk about flow, it's like – it's not like you're not thinking, right? It's just you're immersed in that activity, mm-hmm. only that activity, yeah. concentrated just on that. Yeah, and there's moments where, I th- where I, there's moments where you just be completely lost, but you're still in, you're still thinking. We're always thinking. You're just less less attached, or probably identified with the the thinking. It's just it's it's flowing. I I think of flow a little different. I think of flow not necessarily as this this state we have to enter, but just an interaction with our, our moment to moment experience. I can be flowing right now. If I am open to the experience, if I'm not fighting it, Mm -hmm. if I'm not trying to sound a certain way or say something smart and I'm just being myself, I can have more of a flow with my experience. And I think we can do that when we're cooking burgers, when we're having a conversation, when we're, I, th- I think it's. I think it's something we can always access when we're just authentically with ourselves, and we're not leaning into the next moment. I think most people are constantly leaning into the next moment, thinking about what they're going to say, how they're, you know, right, as opposed to just being right where we are, mm-hmm. and then we're in more of a flow with our experience. Yeah, I think I think it's so fucking hard these days to do that, especially with those phones. Like Mm -hmm. those phones are always there and just like you get on those phones and you're into someone else's life. You're into whatever you're into, all the shit's going on. So even when you're cooking dinner or something to just be there and think about the foods and think about how thankful you are, where the foods came from, where the utensils came from and just being in the moment and stuff. I think that's going to get harder and harder for people to do unless they study and learn about flow and learn about meditation. I almost Mm -hmm. think. Yeah. So this is the next one, uh, page 200. Happy people are extremely social. This is uh, Martin Seligman, 1942, and still alive now. There are three kinds of a happy life, he says. The good life, pursuing personal growth and achieving flow. The meaningful life, acting in the service of something greater than yourself. And both those can lead to, these bring lasting happiness, but this happiness cannot be achieved without social relationships. And then the third one, the pleasant life, socializing and seeking pleasure. Social relationships do not guarantee high happiness, but it does not appear to occur without them. Good social relationships are like food and thermoregulation, universally important to human mood. So that's interesting. This, it's always impressive for me, t- for people, even like Chelsea. Chelsea's going, where's she going? She's going to Spain. She is leaving for Spain on Sunday. So she's legit leaving to Spain by herself. And does she have friends there? She does. So she has a few friends there, but she's going to live by herself. Yeah. So that's impressive when people can move to a new city. And she's only going for a few months, but you, you can move to a new city and just trying to fit in and trying to become happy and trying to find a group of people to hang out with. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she's very social. I mean, I'm... I think it's a spectrum, right? I think I would agree that relationships and, and social circles are very important. I think for me, speaking from my experience, I don't, I need a few good people in my life. I want depth, a handful of people. I don't need a, you know, I don't need to have a hundred people in my life. She's the type of person that is drawn towards more people, having more interaction, more social connections. So I think it's definitely a spectrum and would you say you're a in, introverted person almost? more again spectrum we label these things and we we create these these words that have definitions and that we attach to certain things i think it's just always a spectrum scale to one to ten yeah i'm not a I wouldn't say i'm crazy introverted but i do enjoy depth and you know deep interaction with people you put me in a wedding let's just say it's like gosh when it's just surface 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 it's hard to find depth i don't i'm not drawn to that i've had to yeah, be either. more open to that yeah what's the fucking weather man the weather's been great lately. you like your job yeah i fucking love it mm. i hate that kind of shit dude. yeah it's 
It's like I'd rather sit in my couch and think about the shit I want to watch or think about the stuff I want to think about and watch the shit I want to watch. I'm a homebody too, but I also do like being around people, but I mm. like that mixture. But if I could pick, hey, you want to go out to the bar and have some drinks with some with some friends or sit at home with your dogs, sit at home with my dogs. I'm probably picking that yeah. nine out of ten times. Mm -hmm. um, so he talks about here. Happy lives. Seligman noticed that extremely happy, fulfilled people tend to get on with others and enjoy company. They seem to lead what he called the pleasant life. One of the three distinct types of a happy life that he identified, the others being the good life and the meaningful life. The pleasant life or seeking as much ple pleasure as possible appeared to bring happiness through Seligman found his ways often short lived, less obviously the good life or being successfully engaged in relationships, work and play gave a deeper more lasting happiness similarly the meaningful life or acting in the service of others or something bigger than oneself led to great satisfaction and fulfillment and i think that's where we're pretty lucky you, you get to do that being a trainer and i get to do that being a trainer too and it just something about it just feels good mm -hmm. yeah, these, all, these are all models right people have made up these man-made models of constructing like what happ what is happiness and i think there's no such thing as a right model they're just better thought out ones so it's it's you know you, we read two examples that are talking about similar things that are slightly different right it's, it's again it's a man-made model of what happiness is made up of and seems like an intelligent one but i wouldn't say it's the it's necessarily the only way to think about it mm -hmm. right the so okay yeah because he said there's, there's the three kinds the yep. good life the uh the pursuing personal growth and achieving flow the meaningful one acting in service to others other people and then the pleasant life socializing and seeking pleasure okay and then he said siegman also observed that good and meaningful lifestyles both involve activities that has his colleague describing flow or deep mental engagement the pleasant life clearly does not involve flow but seligman did find that all the extremely happy people he studied were also very sociable and in a relationship he concluded that social relationships do not guarantee high happiness but it does not appear to occur without them a good and meaningful life may bring eudaimonia but having a pleasant life as well intensify whatever happiness you achieve hmm. yeah i wonder if there's people out there that are just single and don't really have relationships with other people that are truly happy. Mm. Sure there is. Yeah, they probably are. So that's always interesting shit. Is that a book that you, you'll sit down and just read, kind of go through it, or you, you'll jump around and find things that are interesting to you? I just uh, I just flip open, flip open a page, read it, and I'm like, if it kind of interests me at all, like, damn, why do people think this way or whatever? I'll, I'll keep reading it. And this isn't like a long, boring-ass book. It talks about the dates that they thought of these things, and then they put in, I don't know, I just kind of bounce around. Mm. So it's kind of the history of psychology. Yeah, yep. yeah, exactly, the history of psychology. What is the book called, Adam? It's just called The Psychology Book, Big Ideas Simply Explained. Mm. So this one, this one here, got this morning the family factor the, or the family this is a virginia satire she died in 1988 and uh the family is the factory where people are made we learn to react in certain ways to mem to the members of our family it leads to these reactions shape a role that we adopt especially when under stress this role may overwhelm our authentic self and be taking with us into adulthood the family is the factory where people are made. And then she talks about all these different roles. Um, by, by knowing how to heal the family, I know how to heal the world. She talks about these different roles that in the family household. It's kind of interesting one too. But you forget about that. When people are doing dumb shit, when people are acting a certain way or being fucking retards, it's like they were probably built in a shitty factory. Mm -hmm. A shitty factory with shitty parents who probably didn't love them that much. Maybe. Okay, we'll go to another one here. 152. This one talk, talks about, this is Boris Cyrillink, 1937. He's still alive today. Our history does not determine our destiny. Bad things happen, and you can feel crushed and in, inadequate and continue to suffer, or you can accept the challenge and move forward with your life. 
-hmm. Resilience is a person's ability to grow in the face of terrible problems. It's so I, I, like, and I, and I wonder if that's comes from the fact you're made from too, or if it's just genes sometimes, because you see some people bad thing can happen and it'll skyrocket them to just grow more or bad things will happen. And then just fucking spiral downhill. Mm, mishmash nature, nurture. I mean, I, I tend to think of things through the model of mindfulness, right? That's like my, I, I'm drawn to that. Mm -hmm. And so within that framework, there's the idea that suffering only exists in the mind. Happiness only exists in the mind. So everything that we go through gets filtered through our, through a layer of, of consciousness, right? Mm -hmm. So if we perceive something as difficult, shitty sucks like it's gonna suck if we can perceive it as a hurdle to overcome right it's the same event but the perception of the event is completely different like that's a choice and that can be conditioned but if you came from a family that that looked at every event that was difficult as this this shitty you know luck like that you're probably gonna you know, that's the probably the the way you're going to see things as well not to not to say that that person can't overcome that perspective mm -hmm. but right you're a you model what you see yeah right and when you're around kids i mean think think of elena like you see kids and you see how they're just soaking up the environment and they're modeling their parents and what they're around gets just injected into their everything mm -hmm. not to say people can't overcome a shitty start but i would say it's rare especially because the longer that goes on the more you just adapt like the behavior of people around you yeah and you just you're just acting out on shit and you're like i don't even know why i'm acting out on the shit well maybe it was the way your dad your dad talked to your mom when you were three years old and you don't remember that but that's engraved in your brain somehow so i wonder like what kind of like what it would be called, not just a psychologist, can't be just called a psychologist, where you'd go to them and try to rewire your programming. Yeah, a psychoanalyst yeah, or something? Yeah, I mean, I think a psychologist would work would work with you on that. And it, then it would depend on what's their framework. Like I've, I've done, I've worked with a psychologist. I've, I've done counseling. So does this person you're sitting down with, like what model in that book do they base their practice off of? right it's, they're they're you know they've got a degree they've got a master whatever maybe a doctorate in that i'm assuming you know a person that's a psychologist i think it's a phd but they're they're embracing some model right as a as a black belt you have a you have a certain model that you've based your teaching around and then you've made your own yep. right i mean takino is your um professor professor yeah. but you're very different than him mm -hmm. right but you're basis comes from i mean a huge piece comes from him and then all your other coaches and then you make it your own i think it's the same thing with any a psychologist or a coach that a good coach is going to is going to have a wide a wide base of tools to base their model off of mm -hmm. right and it'd be the same as that like what you know what model is the psychologist going off of how do they view the human how do they you view the conditioning of the human mm -hmm. where are they going to try to steer somebody yeah yeah for sure because it's like yeah a big part of the jujitsu comes from takinho and then just a big part of it comes from other coaches and just previous experiences in my life for yeah. sure this one's called uh this is gordon h bauer and he says events and emotions are stored in your memory together when we're in a happy mood we tend to store in in memory the positive things that happen because we pay more attention to the information that agrees with our mood. Events and emotion are stored in memory together. When we are happy, we find it easier to recall memories from a happy time. When we are in unha unhappy mood, we tend to store in memory the negative things that happened. Because we pay more, more attention to the information that agrees with the mood again. Mm. When we are unhappy, we find it easier to recall memories from an unhappy time. Because I feel like there was a lot of unhappy memories for me in high school. But when I think back to it, I think of all the good memories and the good pussy I got back then. <laughs> <laughs> but we, but you're, a ha you're a happy person. Have you all, you've probably always been that way. So maybe that is, I, I'd be, right? Like maybe you're just innately more of a happy person and mm -hmm. you tend to see the, 
the good stuff. So therefore you recall the, I don't know. I've never, I, I've never read that before, but that seems to make sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, okay, sweet. We'll move off the psychology topic a little bit. You go deep into that shit on, on all that shit. This is interesting stuff. Just why people think the way they do and why people act the way they do. For sure. It's always interesting. I want to, sorry, I'm going to yeah, ask good. you as a, as a coach that's around really high level people. Do you tend to see with the, 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 MMA athletes, the jiu-jitsu athletes that you've been around yourself, Sean, do you tend to see certain characteristics that tend to be consistent? And and not not necessarily physical, but mental, like how people perceive difficulty or how they deal with, they, they have a shitty practice or they get beat up or they get submitted. Do, do the ones that rise to the top, do you see them consistently showing Some similar sad. patterns? Is it very? I mean, yeah, I think it just varies so much. Like, I remember back in the day when I'd get beat up in sparring, I'd be so emotional and I'd be like, I'm going to get beat up. My, I'm just thinking in my mind, I'm going to get beat up in my fight. If I'm if I'm sparring that shitty, I'm going to fucking go out and fight shitty. And then I remember seeing Benson Henderson and then Crouch telling me, he's like, Benson, there was a fight camp, fight camps where he would get beat the fuck up every round. And it was terrible fight camps, get injured, get beat up every round. But he, after he would be completely like, emotionless he, he would just look at practice like a champion and then he'd go in, out in his fight and have his best performance um so consistently yeah i don't i think it's hard i, I don't think so it's kind of hard to say yeah but the main thing is just keep coming back yeah keep going consistency what what about this question if you were now fighting you turn that mic a little bit if you were fighting now how would you be different I mean, I know you still compete in jujitsu, mm -hmm. but let's just say you're you're gonna you're going back into full fighting. Yeah, you're you got a you got a UFC fight, and you're now older. You have more experience. You've coached. Mm -hmm. Like, what aspects of you as a fighter do you think would be different? Not physically, but mentally. Yeah, I mean, phys physically would be working with you. That yep. would that would change. That would have changed my whole like whole career I, I guarantee it, i know it would but mentally learning just learning um just being able to be present more yeah and know that these practices aren't what matter mm -hmm. the only thing that fucking matters is that day that i show up and i give my max effort in that 15 minutes mm -hmm. because before if i had bad practice it would fuck fuck with me all day if i had bad sparring it would fuck with me the whole it would almost ruin my day I would think about fighting so much and it almost it would just almost burn me out. It wasn't good. Mm -hmm. So just learning to be in the moment a little bit more, learn to know what I know what I'm gonna give good effort and practice, whatever happens, happens. And then the fifteen minutes of that fight, that's what matters. Yeah. That's what fucking matters. So yeah. just being able to be present more. Yeah. And and knowing the tools to do that. Yeah. I think I I think that's, I agree. I think that's something that you, that's a skill you, the earlier you pick that up, the better, mm -hmm. the more you can welcome struggle and it's opportunity. You get beat up in practice. Actually, that's probably good. That means you're growing. Like if you're dominating every practice, probably not hard enough. Mm -hmm. And rather than pushed shit that's uncomfortable, push emotions, fear, uh, insecurity whatever whatever pops up is like push it away you more welcome it open to it mm -hmm. you know i think that is a as somebody that you know has been around a little bit a little bit longer now like i tend to that's if i'm working with anyone i'm trying to get them to welcome uncomfortable stuff just let it be mm -hmm. all emotion is you know it's good mm -hmm. sadness is good fear is good we all have it welcome it and then fucking grow right and then just get better and keep showing up and keep working. Yeah, it's fucking good. Okay, this was a question from uh, some guy here. Hey, Tim, I have a quick question. Maybe you'd want to answer on this one with Red Hawk Recap. I wanted to ask you about good meals to eat in between sessions when you train in the morning and then at night. I know it's good to get carbs in after the first session, but if you could give me an example or two, how you refuel for the second session, that would be awesome. Um. So I sent that question to Dan Garner. He's the, he's, the, he's the man when it comes to that kind of stuff. And let's hear what he said here, boys. 
My man Timbo, what's going on? All right, dude, when you're having a meal in between two sessions, it's crucial to properly fuel your body. If you've got two intense workouts, let's use the, the example of one BJJ session, then you're going to have a meal, and then you're going to move into a strength and conditioning session. These are two glycogen depleting events, and it's actually ideal for you to have a balanced meal in between these two workouts. You don't want to overemphasize anything because you do want to replenish glycogen stores with carbohydrates. You do want to support muscle repair with your protein, but then you're going to need a small amount of healthy fats in there for sustained energy and to help stabilize your blood sugar in between these two events because it's a lot of hours of ongoing activity. So for sustained energy, repair, growth, maintain society and maintain energy, I think a chicken and quinoa salad is actually a great option for athletes to use. And it can be as simple as one cup of cooked quinoa, four ounces of grilled chicken breast, about a handful of mixed greens, and half an avocado. You throw that in there, it's going to be absolutely delicious, and you're actually checking all the boxes for immediate energy needs from all of your macronutrients, but it's coming in the form of foods that are very dense in micronutrients as well. So the important points of B vitamins, magnesium, electrolytes, things that were lost in the first session are now also going to be restored and ready to rock for the second section session, not just from your supplements, but also from your meal. So if you can get something like that in between sessions, sessions and make sure you have plenty of water with it as well to make up for that hydration debt you are going to be rocking and rolling and going into that second session feeling way better than if you did something else well there you have it a little quinoa action i remember my always favorite thing would do i would always do this like oat bran bowl the oat bran is like i think it's just i don't know if it's just blended up oats I don't know if it makes it easier to digest or what. I'd do that in a little pan with a little almond butter, a little bit of berries, a little bit of honey. And that always would all, about an hour and a half. Any, a little window, two hours to an hour and a half before practice was perfect. Then I'd go into practice and I'd feel like it was completely digested. I feel like the blood was flowing to my muscles instead of flowing to my stomach trying to digest that food. I'd always feel good off that. But uh, Garner knows his shit, so that's probably better. <laughs> What did you have for breakfast this morning? What did I have for breakfast this morning? I did not eat breakfast. I was up early, um, which, you know, for me, it kind of depends on my morning where I'm at. And then I had, I did a, a protein shake a little bit later when I got to work. Um, coconut milk, protein, and then I had... What kind of protein you been doing? I used the... Um, thorn? Thorn. We got thorn. And then I had a little, uh, some chicken breast, um, a little Havarti cheese, and like a lettuce wrap. Damn, so you got it fucking dialed. Yeah, so for me, that's like super easy and quick. When I'm in a bind, I'll just buy good quality meat and then do some cheese. Havarti cheese, I tend to gravitate, and I'll just wrap it in lettuce. So it probably would be better to do like a full salad, but... It was one of those where I wasn't prepared, so that's a good – I always have that in my refrigerator at work. And you like sipping on – because you start your – when you do your coffee, do you do it bulletproof? I, I have in the past. I don't anymore. I make – I use the Chemex. I'll do a pour-over, and typically I'm using just layered the, – the layered creamer. So that's got – it's got. I think it's coconut milk. It's got the mushrooms. All the good shit. Yeah, I love that. What I have been doing recently that – I feel makes a difference is I do an element. So I, I hydrate like right away. Like I'll hydrate in the morning first thing and then have my coffee. I feel like if I slam one of those element hydration packs, I just, I feel better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. This morning we, we, I went on a little run. There's that, that little park we measured right, right across the hall. I mean, right across the street from my house, it's about 0.33 miles. Yeah. 0.33 miles. And uh, JX says he could bear crawl that no problem. And I tend to disagree. Are you guys so, going to do that? Yeah, we're going to do it for a vlog. Yeah. Uh, it'll be part of one of my vlogs. And he's going to bear crawl it. And every time he gets around it to the finish line without standing up once, <laughs> he'll get $100. Easy. So go around it 10 times, you get a thousand bucks, bud. Rent's paid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. I'll do it easy, bud. All right. <laughs> he has no clue how hard that's going to be. We'll see. So that'll be good. I, I think he can do it, but it, <laughs> it is going to be hard. <laughs> don't I don't lie. know. His little muscles are going to give. I'll put a freaking out. weight vest on, too. Dude. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Jay's an athlete. What do you weigh? 150? 
or like 145 tops. Okay. Yeah. yeah. If anybody could do it, it's Jay. He might be able to. Got He's going to surprise me if he can, I'll tell you that much. <laughs> okay, Navalism. We'll give you a little Navalism here. See what your thoughts on this are, Brandon. The overeducated, the overeducated are worse off than the undereducated, having traded common sense for the illusion of knowledge. Mm. Yeah. There it is. There. I mean, think of this. When I when I hear that, what I think of is this idea of like illusion of story or a delusion of story where because the conditioning of our society, like how we frame success and how we frame somebody that is intelligent, like we tend to see the person that is educated. They went to a, a prestigious university. That person then believes that bullshit not to say they can't be intelligent but there is this delusion of who they are that they'll tend to not be open to anything else yeah because they're they're educated yeah so you you see that in people that are really successful financially as well that they because that because of the way society views success and their success fits into that model they tend to be horrible at actually listening to other people and still picking up shit. Yeah, because they got it, right? They made it. Yeah, they, you don't have a Lambo. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's um Okay, here's a here's a here's something I try to live by. It is wisdom which is seeking for wisdom. So, how I perceive that statement is that if you are open to if you are looking for knowledge, that is that is wisdom. So the person that is open to continue to learn that's the wise person. So for me, as a, if I'm looking for a coach, I want somebody that doesn't tell me they have the answers, that tells me they have a perspective that they believe can, can drive me in a good direction and I get to make the decision for myself. How, I'm sure you see that so much with strength conditioning coaches and people that come from, they get a degree from the college and they're like, no. That's not what the professor told me Yeah, in my college. And you don't have a degree. I bet you see that a lot in that. In every field. I mean, and go back to, you made a statement about the phone and social media. It, it, the guru gets more hits. The guy that makes the, or the person that makes these absolute statements that I have the answer for you. Here's, you know, three steps to whatever, build bigger muscles, get lean, become a better in jujitsu. Like that, that clickbaity thing draws people in. I think about this a lot because that's not my nature. So it's, I think why people are drawn to that is people want answers. They don't want to think for themselves. Mm-hmm. But again, the, 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 per, you could be, you could have a double PhD and still be open to learning. When you close yourself off, you miss everything, right? Like almost like, uh, say, Liver King. Like yeah. he said, like, like I've got the answer. He's a salesperson. He's a marketer. He might be very knowledgeable. I, you know, I don't know. I don't, I try not to get pulled down that direction, but again, it works socially. It works digitally. Right. And you know what? Great. Again, I just think there's this going back to that statement. It's like the person that buys into their own bullshit, they don't listen to anybody else. They think they know it all. Like you're, you're stuck. Now you're fucked. You know, I mean, you know how much I've learned from you? And not just in, just because I'm open to watching you do what you do or Jay or anyone like, mm-hmm. as a, a, again, I think as a, as a human that, that is trying to cultivate curiosity, we pay attention and we listen and we're open to everything. Yeah. And that's where I think like, uh, religions have it. They dialed it in the perfect way to be like, don't be open to everything. Mm. If if you open yourself up to everything, Satan will creep himself right in there. It's control. Yeah, complete control to where it's like, I, I I told my mom, I'm like, you're mom, you're super like brainwashed, and she's like, what's wrong with a clean brain? I said, well, that's true. Mm. But yeah, completely closing it off to being like, hmm, I'm gonna maybe see, I'm gonna take a, just take a peek at this religion. I'm not gonna be a part of this religion. I'm gonna take a peek at it. They, 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 that's closed off. There's a wall there. And if you go past that wall a little bit, that's Satan. 
that's Satan. Mm. And it's just closed. I'm like, damn. The, so religion's got it figured out. Yeah. To it, shut that open mindedness down. Yeah. It's just be a blind follower. Don't question. We should question everything. Like that should be our our a principle. Question everything, mm -hmm. and you know, look for smart people to provide uh, perspective to provide answers, but question that. Mm -hmm. Like as a human, like you know, question everything, and then you know you you're open to everything. That's good. Good good advice is just question everything. Do research for yourself and find out your own little opinion there. You've heard. If you, if you guys are probably see, have you seen like Bruce Lee talk about, you know, empty your cup. Mm -hmm. He's talking about like a cup that's over. It's that's, that's the, you know, emptiness, an empty mind is a mind, a cup that's not overflowing is a cup that can accept new information. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, I, I think we, I think you have to have awareness of that. And then with awareness, you start to become more open. You start to pay attention more. You learn so much more when you're not closed off. Yeah, and I and, and then part of me wonders, like, even with re, even with religions, or even, I guess, even the government sometimes when they try to make mushrooms and weed illegal, the mushrooms and weed they almost like open up a different path in your mind to look at things a completely different way. Mm -hmm. And I know religions want to shut that down. They don't want you looking at shit any different way. They want you to shut. And if that messes with your brain a little bit. And then same with the, even the government. They don't want you looking at shit a different way. They want you to listen. You be a robot. You be a part of the system. Mm -hmm. Go get your education and just just listen and just be a fucking robot. Yeah. But then the mushrooms, you, t you smoke a little bit of weed and you're like, whoa. You look at something with a completely different perspective. Yeah, that's good. Can be good. Yeah, it sure. can be, I guess. So we'll go, we'll go into some, to some shit Jay sent me here or some. <laughs> Some dumb shit. That is Chuck's day. Johnny Depp all donates all of Amber Heard's $1 million settlement to charity. Well, that's good. Former President Donald Trump is now under arrest and booked on federal charges. Trump has pleaded not guilty to 37 charges brought against him. Wow. You guys are getting political on so this. He's in the, he, so he's in, he's in the... He's in the pen. Tim likes Trump. No, no, no. He Remember, he being, got he's been indicted. Yeah, indicted. That what does that mean, <sighs> dude? Again, don't Do don't quote me on this, but that I believe there's they're they're stating there's enough evidence to take him to court. Like that's an indict. Okay, and so there are there is clear evidence that he can be could be prosecuted. Oh. I believe. So he was placed under arrest by a deputy U.S. marshal and is booked. And his booking process and that of his aide, co-defendant, uh, completed. The marshals are expected to take electronic copies of his fingerprints at some point during today's proceedings. They are not expected to take a mugshot of Trump, given his recognizability. Donald Trump has pleaded not guilty to 37 charges. Trump's lawyers asked for a jury trial during the former president's arraignment Tuesday at a federal courthouse in Miami. We must, we most certainly... Enter a plea of not guilty, Trump's attorney said, told the judge. So he asked for a jury trial. So how do they decide if they're going to have a, do a jury trial? Don't know clue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But that was smart of him. Should have done that when you got your speeding tickets, G. I want a jury. <laughs> I want a fucking jury. <laughs> <I'll> imagine. <laughs> uh, but that was smart of him because who knows what the, what the judge judge thinks about that shit. He's such a high profile dude having a jury. Probably the jury's going to come together for imagine, 37, 37 counts of shit, though. Holy fuck. No, imagine everything passes, like he clears, and then he's president again. <laughs> well, what's the other option? Sleepy Joe. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking Sleepy Joe. You don't follow much politics at all, do you? Mm, I, I try to pay attention enough that I'm not completely ignorant, but then not get so wrapped up into it. Mm -hmm. it's, to me, it's very frustrating. Yeah, for for that for for politics and shit to affect your emotions, mm. it's like what's the fucking point? You see these old farts that watch the TV. Like even sometimes my dad posting shit on Facebook, you tell he's just fired up about it. I'm like, why are you gonna let that mm -hmm. fucking control your emotions? Yeah, I'll go back to the idea of question everything. I mean, man, people buy into some crazy shit just because it's it's fitting their narrative. You know, it's. Yeah, there's a lot of complexity there that I just I choose not to 
get too deep into it for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, Jorge Masvidal says his highest payday in the UFC was five million. That sounds that sounds pretty right. I would say five million. Did that win, win and or show and win, or you think that's just a like the flat to probably show it. win in his pay per view cut. So everything. Mm-hmm. Yep. Okay, here we go. Men really go through it. It's embarrassing it. moment. Go. I done forty seconds. Shake my head. Most embarrassing. Most moment. embarrassing sex moment. Go. I done forty <laughs> seconds. Shake my head. She didn't even know. I just pulled out and said, "Nah, you're not ready for this," and got dressed. <laughs> That's pretty good. Is that? What about you? Uh, most embarrassing sex moment. The guy said he started fucking her and he nutted. And then he's like, nah, you're not ready for this dick. And then he uh, <laughs> pulled his man. That's good. I remember Joe Riggs would tell me he, he when he'd bust, he would he would be pumping and he'd bust. And he, he'd pretend he'd throw his back out. Like, my back. <laughs> he's like, I'm sorry, I can't. My back's fucked up. Oh, my God. So that's a good What about one. you, though? What's your most embarrassing? Besides that one when you were in the bathroom? When I was folding my wiener and that girl, maybe that was kind of embarrassing. Uh, there's been some embarrassing ones, though. Like, maybe when I was having sex with that girl, we're juniors in high school. Her dad starts walking down the stairs. In her room, there's her room. And then you go in front of the stairs to the living room. And some way, somehow we made it to the living room or the downstairs living room, whatever. And we're both butt naked. And we're juniors in high school. And then you could see on the couch. We're both butt naked on the couch. And then you could see on the stairs his da- her dad walking down walking down and i just like i almost like panic so i roll onto the floor and i grab this xbox game and i'm just sitting there waiting for this guy to just explode (laughs) and she says dad stop and his feet stop and then they walk back up and i'm like holy fuck that was close see my little wing little wiener fucking saggy condom hanging off of it (laughs) so it's beating my ass (laughs) fuck another embarrassing time another embarrassing time i was having uh intercourse with this girl and um intercourse <laughs> we turned on the lights and it was like a fucking someone got killed oh there shit. was blood on the pillows there was blood on the walls there was blood blood on the like on my fi- like everywhere Ugh. and we turned on the lights and she was so embarrassed i'm like no it's okay i just bother me oh i was trying God. to make her feel good but i was like it was so gnarly. I think she didn't know she was on her period or something. And, and it's dark in that room. <laughs> uh, let's hear another one here. What about you, Brandon? I don't know. I mean, that, I'm thinking as I'm trying to listen, I'm thinking the the one that comes up to my mind, it wasn't sex. It was I was a I was a teenager and I had bought condoms because I wanted to. Jacking them. Yeah, I wanted to learn how they worked. <laughs> and I. And did that and i flushed it down the toilet and i flooded the bathroom and my stepdad you know who's a great man and look up to he you know later he like he thought i was having sex in the house and he you know pulled me aside and he was giving me that talk and i was just and i you know just told him i just i don't even think i could get it out i think he knew that i was so embarrassed but i was like i didn't do it i didn't have sex in the house i just <laughs> used the condom and flushed Jack. it down the toilet <laughs> But flooded the bathroom. So. Yeah, you you flush those condoms down the toilet. They'll fucking they'll come up That's later. True, because how did you learn how to use a condom, Tim? I remember getting a condom and s- sliding that puppy on. I'm like, wow, this feels good. But you just knew how to put it on. You just put it on. I fucked with it a little bit, and then it's <laughs> fo- and then I was like, oh no, you flip it around this way, and it slides on. Did you ever jack in a condom? Never. You never did. I never did that. I don't know. Huh? Yeah, I did that. It was great. Then you got to learn how to use it. Mm-hmm. You. you can you go back to when you first realized that you could jack off? Oh yeah. <laughs> and can you, th- for you, if you go back to that, did you just do it all the time as a kid? Well, it was weird for me. I'd like hump my pillow a little bit, <laughs> bit and I'm like, wow, that feels good. I'm going to touch that fucking little thing. And I went like this. <laughs> I didn't know to grab it. Yeah, yeah. I would just go with it like this with my four <laughs> fingers. And I'm like, oh, that's fine. I thought that's how you jack. So you may so think about being a parent of a teenage boy that first figures that out. And then fucking every chance you get, you're just, you're just yanking you, you know, so you're finding, I don't know. I'd fucking use socks. I'd go, you know, mm-hmm. there'd be t- toilet paper. Like I, my, my parents had to know. Yeah. Any fucking hole you, you just, see, you're just like, I'm going to fuck it. Just think <laughs> about that. You just know your, te- your teenage boy is now at that age and they're just figuring it out. And you're just like, all right, like just, you know, you 
pray for the best at that point, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, or just talk to them, say, just do it privately. Make yeah. sure you don't bust in a girl. Yep. I, I hope I, I'm. I hope I'm good at communicating to my kids. I, I think I will be, but we'll see. Who knows how those kids turn out? Well, Jay and I were talking about it yesterday, like how hard it is just to say no to people. The art of saying no, and in reading these leadership books, how important it is to be able to communicate to your employees, to people, and not rub them the wrong way. Mm-hmm. Like you put it away to where the message gets across but you still respect them. You're not mad at them or anything. Are you pretty good at saying no to things? No, but I've gotten better. For me, I go back to that idea of don't, don't take anything personal. And if, and if somebody else doesn't embrace that, if that's not one of their principles, that's not my problem. That's what helps me is that I'm going to try to be honest. I'm going to try to be upfront. I'm never going to come from a bad place. And I think hopefully people see that in me. Therefore, if I give somebody feedback and they can't accept it or see it, that's, that's not on me. Mm-hmm. Hard to do. It's not my nature, but I do feel like I've gotten better at it. If you go, like, have you read the book, The Four Agreements? I feel like that's a book you've read. Yeah. I'll, 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 you know, I'll, don't, take, I'll, don't take anything personal. Like, mm-hmm. And you know, you're not responsible for other people's emotions. As principles, that has helped me. It's hard. This is not again my nature. I'm a, I'm by nature a, a pleaser, a, but I feel like that perspective and that awareness of that has helped me. That if if you know me and you know I'm coming from a good place, if I say something that that offends you or upsets you, that's you know it's that's you. You're reacting. You're emotionally reacting what I say. You know me well enough that you would talk to me about it. Mm-hmm. But a lot of people, again, because they they push away difficulty. You go back to what we, we talked about a long time ago. It's like push it away. That's on them. Mm-hmm. It's not my fault. Yeah. Yeah. Saying no to shit. I mean, like, so it's like, it's such a powerful thing. I'm trying, I'm trying really hard to get better at saying no because so many opportunities are coming up. Uh, but yeah, I mean, especially as a coach, like, as a coach, you keep, people get offended if you say they're doing something, but I try to just be blamed. Like, I, not gonna lie to you i could bullshit you mm. i could bullshit you and just say something but it's not gonna make you better it's not gonna make you aware of what you're doing wrong yeah having a coach who's honest with you is good too yeah that that person learns to not take it personal that could be one of the most powerful steps in their career yeah i mean i mean but then there is some coaches that you can't just like be so whatever my coach is i've seen some coaches say things to athletes and i'm like, why the fuck would you say that? Mm-hmm. They look up to you and respect you a lot. That could affect their whole career. Right. Like, why would you say that? So taking things, taking things from coaches that are good and yeah. then just ignoring shit, the bad, the bad shit that they, they do or the shit that annoys you. Mm-hmm. No coach is going to just be fucking perfect. Yeah. Yeah. There's an art of communication. There's an art of, of having a vision for in the example of coaching, having a vision for the individual and then steering them, right? Mm -hmm. Again, man, that's one of the things that I've I've admired about you is seeing your relationship with Sean and seeing and how you are with other people. And just, I I think you're very good at making people feel good and confident while also challenging them to be better. I think you're a really good coach and I'm, I'm assuming that's natural to you but you've also worked at it you're reading these books you know you're cultivating that fuck thanks yeah dude. yeah i mean it's fucking tough what are you gonna say jay no I was just gonna ask uh brandon if like how he's working with sean do you plan on working with like more guys is that your goal or do you just mma yeah we work with several athletes yeah i mean like MLB i mean guys. i have a lot of baseball guys in the off season i, I mean i've cut you know kind of a cool career in that I've had a lot of different high level people, different sports. I I really enjoy MMA. It's cuz I cuz it's so complex. Um and I see the more I'm around it, the more I see gaps in that I do I do think most people probably just overtrain. There's this huge gap in just everything and they're just beat up constantly. And so there's there's this opportunity to help people. Um I just, I, for me, it'd be like taking on the right people, you know? So, um, and it's cool. Like Bryce Meredith, like who, you know, you guys know who's a, he's a really good athlete. He's coming up in the sport. 
Um, but I would love to work with other people. It's just a matter of it being the right fit. Yeah. I mean, God, all the people I care, like truly care about, especially f fighters that are getting to that level. Oh my God, I wish there was more of you because I think it's, it's rare. Strength conditioning coaches, so many of them work, guys, work these guys so hard. When our hard works a lot in the room, every single workout I've had with you, I, I feel like we did a lot of work, but it's not like beating down on my joints. Like everything's just so different when it's training with you. Mm -hmm. But it's like, fuck, you're only one guy. Are, do you do you train other trainers? Yeah, I mean, I have a staff of eight people, um, and I have worked with people as uh, like an apprentice type ship or an internship. I want to be able to do more of that. I have to create that content and i've got to create those models i resist that because of my mentality that there is no right but you have to have something you know so so i definitely have aspirations of creating um uh workshops and, and creating digital content that can help people with that perspective mm -hmm. i mean it's i was talking to somebody yesterday about it it's like th so think of your your ring your aura ring or your whoop and this idea of readiness what is it doing it's trying to quantify how ready you are to grow, to train, right? And I think that technology does a decent job, but there's still holes in it. But you're aware of it. Your readiness is low. So the other day, you were your readiness was down. You didn't feel good. So imagine if you would have went into strength and conditioning, you wouldn't have told me, and I would have still had this perspective that we're we grinding. fucking grind today. And our program is it's a heavy lift day it's a max effort day but you're bre you're beat up your nervous system is is fatigued you have, you have global fatigue you're very you're more likely to get hurt and that's that's what i see everywhere it's not just an mma but it but it, mma is so fucking hard on the body mm -hmm. so i think it's just this perspective in strength and conditioning that that because it's MMA and it's hard that it, it just has to be easy, crazy, you know, glycolytic circuits that, and then I think people just are more prone to getting injured. Mm -hmm. And in that same respect, you have different bodies, you have different humans, different bodies. And I look at shape, like the structure of a body is going to be better at doing different things. And you have to take that into account. So if you bucket everybody into the same bucket, you, you know, I just think you're you're likely to get people hurt and then you don't know like you never know is it because of strength and conditioning is it because of their diet there's a lot of complexity in that but i think in general when you look at the sport people are overtraining. yeah so as i tell you it's like shug in this example mma is his thing he it's he's not a he, strength and conditioning is not a sport Strength and conditioning should be complementing it. It should be, it should be supplementing and enhancing his ability to show up for you and get better. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean getting stronger and becoming more explosive and becoming faster isn't important. It is, but there's a fuck. There, it's way more nuanced than that. It's it, there's a lot of risk in loading a body, especially in a bad position, and that's subjective. And then they go out and they get hurt in their sport like that. What doesn't do that. That's, that's not the goal, you know? So, so yeah, it's a, it's interesting sport. Yeah, for sure. I so think, I think they're more like guidelines and like, that's why I like Rick Rubin's book. Cause it's not like, Hey, do it this way. It's mm -hmm. like, they're just guidelines, mantras, thoughts, and just kind of take it as you please. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I like his, I like his, I have his, his new book. I'm not through it yet, but yeah, I like his way of thinking. Yeah. I mean, to me, you go back, go back to like flow and like as an artist or as a producer, dude, like to me, that guy is a great example of, mm -hmm. of that, you know, there isn't, an, he's an interesting dude, man. He seems like he's cultivated a lot of awareness and yeah. stillness in his life. And yeah, I look up to that. Hell yeah. So we're a little over an hour now. Uh, hope you guys enjoyed the podcast. Uh, what's your Instagram again? Higher human at yeah. higher human. And I think there's a double underscore. I don't know if that matters. I think I think if you, I you, my, yeah. Put the link in the description. Okay, yeah. we'll put the link in the description. Give Brandon a follow. And then if you guys want to support, uh, patreon.com slash Red Hawk Academy. Years of content up there. Uh, and I 
really try to get back to everyone on there and i try to do a lot of stuff on the patreon so if you enjoy it if not hit the sub button we're yeah. almost to fifty thousand. Oh yeah. yeah we're almost to fifty thousand. still fucking going at it i want to so. give you give you a little plug back to your newsletter really yeah. well done oh fuck so you yeah. guys if you haven't subscribed to that hit that up because i like that man i i like that check it in on you every week and even though i know what you got going on it's cool to see it's a good you're, do, you're doing a really good job like keeping it simple and summarizing some good shit so hell yeah fuck yeah thank you bro all right guys see you next week love you bye-bye peace